Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. Uh, welcome to Cambridge Central Mosque live on YouTube. I'm Ibrahim Rahman, I'm your host for today's event. And I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. We're delighted to be taking part in the Open Cambridge Festival for 2021, organised by the University of Cambridge uh, for the second year running. And this year, Open Cambridge is promoting the theme of Edible England. And this is highlighting the city's culinary and uh, culinary heritage and culture, I should say. And here at the mosque, we were all thinking about how could we uh, be part of that conversation? Um, what's our take on the theme? And this is what we're doing today. We are looking into healthy living in Islam. And today we'll be exploring topics around healthy eating and well-being. And we'll also be looking at the Islamic perspective on maintaining our physical health. And to help me uh, navigate through this, I'd like to introduce Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, who is the chair of the Board of Trustees of Cambridge Central Mosque. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, it's good to be here. Great, it's great to have you with me as well. And before we get started, I'd just like to remind all of you watching, just some quick reminders, this program is being recorded and we also invite you all to join in with this discussion. So please use the live chat in this YouTube live stream. You can pop your questions in there and at some point during the program, we will try and respond to some of your questions. Sheikh Abdul Hakim, I'm sure we'll be very happy to answer them. Let's get started, Sheikh. Um, what does Islam teach us about eating healthily? Well, Islam is the kind of religion that recognizes the rather obvious fact that body and soul interact with each other. You can't really separate them. And so what we do to the soul, like, for instance, a sudden bereavement, for instance, a drastic shock to our inner system, can have sometimes biomedical consequences. And similarly, something that drastic that happens to our outward form, like losing our legs in an accident or something like that, tends to affect our inwardness as well. We might feel anxiety, we might feel depressed, we might have a different way of processing information about the world. We can't separate the two. And so uh, the task of religion is to uh, improve us and polish us spiritually so that we can perceive the sacred in the world and address the presence of God in the next world successfully. But in order to do that, we can't neglect our outward form. Sure. Uh, and this is one reason why we have so many hadiths, which are the sayings of the Prophet in Islam, which are, are about health and why medicine has been such a respected profession in the Islamic religion until about 300 years ago. Even here in Cambridge, the students at Addenbrookes would be learning from translations of Arabic texts. Right. Uh, because the medieval Muslim doctors were respected outside as well as inside the world of Islam. So it's very much part and parcel of Muslim culture. I see. So um, you touched upon the, the hadith, the prophetic saying. So that's one thing I'd like to actually ask you about. Let's look at the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, peace and blessings be upon him. Um, what was his lifestyle like? What would he typically eat, you know, his usual meals during the day? Uh, what kind of activities also uh, did he partake in as well, physical activities? Uh, could you tell us a bit more about his lifestyle? Well, the lifestyle really of all of the sages and the saints and the prophets of history has been oriented towards higher things. In other words, it's not really about binging at a restaurant and being concerned with fine foods. It's about eating what you need, as he says in one of his sayings. It is sufficient for the descendants of Adam that they should eat a few morsels which are enough to enable them to remain upright. And if they have to eat more, then it should be a thir third of the stomach should be for the food, a third for drink and a third for breath. So this is a kind of ascetical principle, if you like, or an unworldly principle. And you find the same thing in, in Christian spirituality and Buddhism and in the world religions generally, that in order to be open and to ref be refined enough to perceive the unseen world, uh, you have to be travel light, as he said, najal mukhifun, which is a famous hadith or saying of the prophet, those who take little or travel light, as we'd say nowadays, they travel away, they, they, they succeed in their journey. Mm. If we go through life carrying heavy baggage, even if it's just obesity, but attitudinal baggage as well, uh, then we may find it very difficult to take those necessarily difficult spiritual footsteps. So his was an austere life, a life of frequent fasting, a life when for months, we're told, no fire would be lit in his house and he would live on dates and water and perhaps a few gifts of dried cheese that neighbours might give him. Uh, so yeah, a very uh, austere kind of life. But of course, that kind of life tends to be associated with longevity 
people who live in mountains and don't eat modern processed foods and don't become overweight, they do tend to be the ones who make it past the age of 100. So uh, sometimes <laughs> uh, our indulgence in food is a two-edged sword and it may bring us short-term gratification, but in the long term, we store up all kinds of medical and also spiritual uh, ailments. Uh, there's always a price to be paid for every indulgence. Absolutely. No, that's very interesting to hear about that. Um, it really does just showcase and just highlights how simplistic uh, his lifestyle was. You know, the fact that he would eat things like dates and mm -hmm. water and, um, and you, know, as, you know, things like that, really. So um, I'd, like, I'd also like to find out more about um, the, the previous prophets that came before mm -hmm. him as well, who were also mentioned in the Qur'an, um, what were their lifestyles like? Was it quite similar to the Prophet Muhammad or uh, did they have um, a very different lifestyle altogether? Or what was it like for them? Well, as I say, the sages, the saints, the prophets of mankind agree on the essential things. You know, the religions are not as far apart as people sometimes imagine. And in terms of the path to sainthood and to inner purification, it is about forms of renunciation. And more important than renouncing is just having the correct attitude, really not being very interested. As one of the early Muslims said, it's for the heart to be empty of what the hand is empty of. A life of poverty, renunciation, that is enabled by the richness of a life in which you love nature, you love other people, you're interested in human engagement, you're too preoccupied with the wonder of the human experience, and the divine experience and the light of prayer, really to care too much about what's on the plate at the end of the day. That's, that's pretty universal. So certainly for the earlier uh, prophets that the Quran recalls. The one who is singled out particularly in the Muslim memory as a real ascetic is of course Jesus. The Muslim memory of, of Jesus, who of course is very much respected in the Quran as, as the Messiah, uh, is that he was uh, absolutely a kind of friar. He didn't have a home, he didn't carry anything with him, uh, he just lived on the basis of charity that was given to him as and when it came. And that's been a certain model. Uh, but generally the Islamic model, which is of course the Prophet Muhammad's way, is not to go to extremes, as some would see it, in terms of radical forms of fasting, radical renunciation, not having a home, not having a wife and a family, but rather to keep a kind of middle course. So balance, balance is what yeah. religion always recommends. Absolutely, that moderation, really. That's, uh, that's really good to hear. Um, so uh, I know we we've kind of loosely touched upon the the Qur'an, and, but what else, you know, what other verses are there really about to really highlight the importance of maintaining that, that healthy lifestyle, you know, what other, um, apart from the examples of the prophets that we've mentioned there, but um, you know, what else is really mentioned in the Qur'an that yeah, you could explore further? Well, the practice of fasting, of course, is known to bring health benefits, the practice of renunciation, and we do have an obesity epidemic now. Um, it's partly due to COVID and people being immobile, but partly also due to the fact that people's lifestyles are more sedentary. They don't go out so much, they drive too much, they eat fast foods, and uh, obesity is a real problem for the NHS and allied uh, issues. Uh, I, I believe that the number of uh, cases of obesity in the last three years in the United States has technically doubled. It's a very, very major uh, disorder. And the prophet did not like unnecessary fatness in human beings and he specifically criticized people who he thought were gluttons. Gluttony of course one of the deadly sins even though it's kind of encouraged by today's high consumption consumer lifestyle. Sure. Uh, and particularly he didn't like overweight religious leaders. He says, God dislikes the portly scholar the image of the Imam of the mosque perhaps is carrying too much baggage because he enjoys his biryani too much and doesn't take enough exercise, is one that we're familiar with, but one that the Holy Prophet specifically uh, criticizes because that's not what a religious leader should be. So certainly the, uh, the practices of religion emphasize this and physical strength because the stronger you are, the more you're able to engage in good works and in worship. And he said, uh, a strong believer is better than a weak believer, but there's good in both. And one of the meanings of this is to be physically strong. It's something desirable to be physically strong. You can do more, you can help people more, you can, you know, whatever it takes to earn your living uh, and to serve the community. So good health is certainly, uh, it's a form of wealth. One of his sayings was, Al-Afiyah al-Mulku al khafi Health is hidden wealth. 
In other words, you can check your bank statements and see how much you're technically worth. But what's more real to you is actually how you feel physically. That's real wealth. If you're on life support, it doesn't really matter if you're a billionaire and you have a yacht tied up at Monte Carlo. It's irrelevant. Mm. And you'd rather have your health. And there's plenty of Muslim stories about this, um, yeah. about the, uh, the, the caliph who got lost in the desert. Uh, and in the desert, he uh, found that he was unable to pass water and it became more and more painful. And he was with his physicians and they couldn't deal with it and it was agony for him. Right. And so a kind of ragged man comes to him and says, well, uh, what will you give me in order to cure you? And he says, half my kingdom the response, all of my kingdom. And he's so happy to give away everything that he owns, all of the lands of Islam and his towers and his palaces, just so that he can go to the toilet. <laughs> so health is more important than wealth. And when we think about it, that's the case. So it's really something we need to invest in. Absolutely. No, that's uh, very well put, uh, Sheikh. Uh, I just want to go back to something that you mentioned about you know, the, the image of the imam, mm -hmm. really, and in terms of how they look after themselves, because I think one issue that we have, because if, let's say, for example, in our community, you know, there's an imam that we have here and uh, he's so popular, everyone mm -hmm. wants to bring him around their house yep. and we all want to feed him, mm -hmm. because in Islam, you know, being hospitable is very important. Yep. So how would you say an imam should approach this sort of situation where they get invited to so many places? Let's say, like, for example, on Eid day, you yep. know, everyone wants to bring them around and bring lots of food. What's the best way and how they well, can deal with that? Well, I know, I've seen this with my, with my teachers. Uh, it looks as if they're really tucking in, but in fact, if you observe very carefully, you can see the hand is moving around and food is going here and there, and he takes a bit from that plate, but it's not as much as you expect. Actually, they, they tend to eat very little, even though they're being invited to, to feast. Sometimes, I remember once in Morocco, we were invited to four different houses, and a huge tagine and couscous were offered to us as visiting scholars, so-called. Mm. Uh, uh, we managed to survive the experience. Uh, but the scholars for whom that is a lifestyle, of course, they find ways of adapting. And some of them are actually remarkably slim despite that. And when they're on their own with their families, they might compensate by eating almost nothing. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, because mm -hmm. I guess in your case as well, because of all the countries that you've been to, mm -hmm. Everyone wants want to really feed Yes, I mean, the Muslim well, way so. is to feed people, and this is even prophetically mandated. You, you feed your guest and you honor your guest. This is from Abraham and the fatted calf. It's part of religious culture. Mm. Uh, but how you respond to that, yeah, you, have to be, you have to be careful. Apart from anything else, you don't know how many courses are coming. If you binge on the starters, then you may be embarrassed when the mains come in. So you know, the way of the scholars is always to be polite but restrained and hosts who are experienced will kind of see that the sheikh is not actually eating very much but they won't force him because they know that it's going through the motions of uh, feeding uh, without actually um, and doing something that might be inappropriate in, in terms of religious ethics. Absolutely, no, that's uh, very well explained there. Um, just want to remind everyone, um, if you've just joined this live stream, uh, first of all, a welcome uh, to uh, Cambridge Central Muslim Live on YouTube. Uh, we are discussing healthy living in Islam with Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, who is the chair of the Board of Trustees at Cambridge Central Mosque. And uh, you've also got an opportunity to ask questions as well, so please do use the live chat box, which is running parallel to this live stream. And uh, what we can do is ask some of these questions to our Sheikh, and um, hopefully he'll be able to uh, give you some very insightful answers. So uh, please do take this opportunity while you still can. Um, we are going to just discuss the concept of fasting. I know you touched upon that a little bit yep. earlier. Let's go into that a bit further. As you mm -hmm. know, fasting is one of the five pillars of our faith. Uh, of, mm -hmm. you know, it's also known as song in Arabic. Um, but I just want to get down to the, the real basics here. Um, if you could just give us like, almost like a dummy's guide, you could say, what is fasting? What does it actually mean? Well, uh, it's one of the five pillars of Islam and it's obligatory in the fasting month of Ramadan. Mm. But it's also present and central to just about every religious tradition that I can think of. The Christians have Lent, the Hindus have fasting seasons, the Buddhists, Jews have Yom Kippur, kind of universal. And the reason for that is that it is known to be a very direct uh, spiritual benefit. It's not really a diet. Some people think, oh, I'm going to lose a lot of weight this Ramadan. Well, probably you will, but that's not what it's for. So the rule is, uh, kneel by mouth from dawn until dusk for the 28, 29 days of 
the fasting month of Ramadan. And this is known uh, technically as intermittent fasting. And if you check out the kind of wellness websites nowadays, you'll see that there's a lot of interest in intermi intermittent fasting, even from quite sort of secular um, well-being practitioners, that it is known to be the most effective way of burning up certain fats and enzymes in the system that doesn't actually result in long-term damage as a sort of extended kind of uh, uh, strike from food might might represent. So uh, it's something that's very much commended and, and widely practiced. And I think by the end of the fasting month, Muslims do tend to feel spiritually better, but also physically better as well. I remember the Ramadan before last, uh, I'd, two days afterwards, I went along to Addenbrooke's Hospital here in Cambridge to do some routine checks, and they took my blood pressure, and the nurses one of them, and this was extremely good for my ego, said, are you an athlete? <laughs> because my wow. statistics were so good that this was kind of unusual for a guy of my age and size. They thought, well, this is weird. Um, so that was kind of an indication that even if you don't feel it so much, it really is very good for sorting out those vital statistics in the system. And it's also kind of natural to human beings. If you think about how our primordial ancestors lived, and that's the kind of lifestyle for which we're actually designed. You know, for 100,000 years, we were hunter-gatherers. For the last 50 years, we've been living in a very unnatural style. But back then, you know, you'd, you'd kill a gazelle or something, and you'd eat it, and then there might be nothing for a day or so, and then you'd go out and kill something else. It was intermittent fasting. Yeah. Unlike today's practice of grazing and heading to the fridge every hour, or to the coffee machine, or to the chocolate machine in the office, and constantly topping up the blood sugar, which is really not good for us. Mm -hmm. So fasting in the Islamic form, I believe, takes us back to uh, a primordial form of life that's very natural and is actually very good for the body as well as the spirit. Yeah, because it's interesting you mentioned about the hunter-gathering, because that energy, you know, you may, you've, maybe you've eaten <laughs> something before, but then you're, what, you're going out for that next meal, so yep. you're using that energy that you're perhaps mm -hmm. burning off uh, mm -hmm. to actually try and prepare that next meal. Yep. So, yeah, I guess that's what it also helps with, uh, you know, looking after yourself mm -hmm. at the same time, doesn't of it? Of course, yep. yeah. Um, I've got a question that's just come in, actually. Uh, this is coming from Nurhan Ibrahim, uh, who has asked, what are the books that we can read on the position of sports and health in the Islamic civilization by either pre-modern or contemporary scholars? Uh, well, there are books. Uh, one of them, which I quite like, which is quite accessible, uh, is by Prince Ghazi bin Muhammad of Jordan, who used to be the Minister of Sport and youth in the Jordanian government. Okay. So he wrote this in order to link the religious texts with a kind of pro-sport agenda which he was promoting amongst uh, young Jordanians. And it's a very interesting list of the Quranic verses, the hadiths, and uh, the hadiths specifically that commend certain types of sport. So specifically Muslims are supposed to ride horses, uh, to enjoy archery, and to swim. And in some lists there's other sports as well. And we know that the Holy Prophet used to run races sometimes. Mm. Even in middle age, he was really fit. Yes. So <laughs> that's, that's a good uh, book to go for, I would think. It's some, called something like uh, The Islamic Teaching on Sports. But you can find it if you look on Amazon, I'm sure. So that probably is a good place to start. But there's plenty of other books because you know, it, it's right there at the center of our religious heritage. Absolutely, yeah, because I'm just going back to the, um, the lifestyle of the Prophet Sallallahu um, I think I read that he also would partake in horse riding and swimming. Yep. Is that right? So, I mean, were there other activities that he also did, like other sports? Well, you have to remember that that was a world in which there, were, there was no fast food, exactly. in which the food that was available was scant, but it was all organic. Mm. Right. Uh, where our current anxieties about additives and enzymes and the panic over what some of these subtler pollutants are doing to our hormonal system, to gender, to our state of mind, to anxieties, to allergies, mm. was irrelevant because everybody was eating organic all the time. All of the companions of the Prophet only ate organic biofoods. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, they didn't have cars, which meant that they walked a lot or they rode a lot. So whenever they went to the mosque or anywhere, they would be getting exercise and walking, especially if you do it for half an hour or so, is actually one of the best forms of exercise, yes. precisely because it's what human beings have always done. We're designed 
to, to walk. And really, if somebody isn't walking for about an hour a day, then they need to revisit their lifestyle because it's such a, a profound way of restoring one to health. Um, riding as well, you know, sitting in a car might exercise the left hand and maybe the right hand, but it isn't really exercise no. and it's quite bad for the back. Sitting on a horse, or in those days, a camel or a mule, it requires a certain physical agility of all of the body. If you've ridden a horse seriously and you've done more than walk but trotted, the thighs are active, you have to hold tight, you have to, if the horse is difficult, you have to pull it, you have to kick it, whatever it might be, that's good exercise. Yeah. And in the Middle Ages, where in the Islamic world, people traveled a lot. Going on Hajj, for instance, was really good for people's health because not only was there not much food, maybe a bit of dry bread and dates at the end of the day, uh, but there was fresh air, they were outdoors, exercise all day long. Yes. Uh, so the Hajj was always a physical as well as a spiritual regeneration. And sometimes, you know, if you're in northern Nigeria, it might take you six months of walking to get to Mecca and six months back. So you come back if you're still alive and you would be kind of up for anything. Mm. So uh, in those days, yeah, people were you know, naturally fit and anybody, if they wanted to get around and to eat, would, would partake of that. It's a measure of the sickness of today's world, that we're physically sick, the environment is sick, we're psychologically sick, we're just out of kilter with the way which is natural for human beings to be. Absolutely. No, thank you very much, uh, Sheikh. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, Nurhan for that question. We've got some more that have just come through, actually. Um, uh, Azija Khanam has asked, when a woman is nursing her baby, is there any food that's recommended for her to eat or any diet that is beneficial uh, for her and her baby in the Islamic tradition? Well, you'll have to consult the books of prophetic medicine. Different Muslim cultures have different recommendations depending on whether the birth is recent or not. Very often there are foods which are rich in uh, in fat which are rich in honey, grain and so forth, which the metabolism can easily absorb in order to <coughs> restore some of what's been lost as a result of the process of, of, of childbirth. And then uh, in order to facilitate breastfeeding, which is very much recommended in Islam, we don't like bottles particularly, it's, it's in the Quran, that you should breastfeed uh, for up to two years. And this again, because it's the natural food for the baby, is very good in terms of ensuring the, the health and the early development of the child. It's, it's a sunnah, it's a prophetic uh, teaching. Right. Uh, and, and for that also, some of the books of prophetic medicine will recommend particular foods which are recommended to be given. It may vary from culture to culture. Mm. So in Indonesia, they don't have bread or anything made from wheat or barley because it doesn't grow there. Um, in other places, they may not have rice, they may have certain things, they may not have certain things. So it does vary a bit depending on <coughs> the climatic zone because the Islamic world is so enormous from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, but certainly if you look at some of the prophetic medicine books or if you look at Hakim Chishti's book, The Traditional Healer, he has a lot of very good remedies, health tips and also a dietary advice for um, women who have uh, been blessed with that, that, that wonderful experience. Sure. No, that's uh, really good to hear, Jay. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you very much for that question from uh, Azija there. Um, I just want to move on to um, the, you could say, the final part of today's discussion, where um, this has been very much a subject that has affected all of us, really, especially in when we consider <coughs> the context of the pandemic as well, and that is the subject of mental health. Um, so that's something I'd like to explore with you, Sheikh, um, you know, where we could just spend maybe just a good few minutes just to, like, hear about your thoughts in the context of the pandemic and going forward. Um, obviously, everyone's mental health has been affected in this time, but what is the Islamic perspective on this and what have been your reflections over these? I'm not sure it's months, everybody. It? I know people who have been really happy to have some downtime just to be more with family, with books, to recuperate, to do some gardening, to be out of the rat race. <coughs> so I don't think it's been a purely negative experience, particularly for a lot of, lot of traditionally minded religious people. They may have been very grateful for this opportunity for khalwa, for seclusion. Mm, okay. uh, for some people, particularly gregarious people who like to be out and about and engaging physically with people rather than online, uh, it has had issues uh, relating to depression, <coughs> anxiety and other such things. Uh, 
which are hopefully curable once people get back to whatever the new normal really looks like. Because one thing I think that we've all learned very clearly is that human beings are sort of pack animals. We operate in groups. We're not really designed to be solitaries, with a few exceptions. Uh, and that it is natural for us to be with family, mm. with extended family, to be in regular contact with cousins, second cousins, uncles, particularly a Muslim community will be you know, a large family that's constantly talking and chattering and arguing. And that's part of, I think, the very healthy uh, state of, of, of normal Muslim life. So that is, is restored. Neighbourhood also. But uh, I think beyond the pandemic, there is uh, a larger question about modern individualism. The idea that everything is about the self and my gratification and my rights, which is quite destructive and not normal. Because again, to get back to primordial times for which we are ultimately adapted, we always operated in small groups like the Australian Aboriginals or whoever, that's, that's what's normal to us. Yes. Um, and the Hadith, the saying of the Prophet says, God ha God's hand is above the congregation. Mm -hmm. And the fox or the wolf only eats the solitary sheep, right. uh, which has many meanings. One of them is that that person is obviously more likely to fall prey to uh, uh, loneliness, addictions of various kinds, vices of various kinds. There's a protection in, in, in good peer pressure. And unfortunately, Britain is the world's first country to appoint a minister of loneliness because it's recognised as such a, 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 an epidemic. Uh, 11 million people in the UK are reckoned to have uh, loneliness as a recognised medical condition. It's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of its overall health impact, but it can be worse for people who are really afflicted by it. Mm. Uh, and I was talking to a, a hairdresser a while back who was telling me what it's like when the old people come in to have their hair done. And once somebody touches them, they kind of relax. I don't particularly like having my hair cut. It's kind of <laughs> intrusive and annoying. Um, right. But for the old people, and that's because the hairdresser is the only person who ever touches them, ever. For the rest of their life, for decades, they're in front of the TV, they've got the cat, but it's they're like alone. they're not used to that kind of... Yeah, because we need it. We, we, we are touchy-feely people. We're, that's normal for us. Mm. We groom each other, we hug. That's what human beings do, and particularly in a tradition such as Islam, where we're always hugging and shaking hands. Yeah, and just showing that affection. Yeah. That's just very much part of it. I thing. mean, you go to the mosque on the Eid day and everybody's hugging. You've got 2,000 people and they're all hugging. <laughs> Not very good in pandemic times. As you recall, we had to put a stop to the yeah, hugging distancing. side of things. Yeah. But that's, that's very healing and natural. People need to be hugged and need to hug. It's, even little children, it's, it's, it's a primitive thing, but it's essential. Mm -hmm. So in our culture, so many people are alone. So many people are divorced or they're single, they never had a partner, uh, they are incels, for instance, the incel movement is something new. The, most of the recent terrorist attacks in North America and England have come from incels. Uh, we have the loneliness epidemic, uh, and that of course generates very considerable suffering, some of which can be classified as you know, mental health, mm. and there isn't really a pharmaceutical solution to that. Uh, but the antidepressant prescriptions in the UK have doubled in the last 10 years. Right. It really is an epidemic. This loneliness that comes from individualism and the decline of traditional religious, often ideas about society, the family, duty, the generations, means that we're all living alone, doing whatever we like, but mm, it doesn't bring us happiness. No. Uh, so we'll see if the new ministry can actually help. I suspect we need something deeper. Absolutely. But going forward, I guess, um, what do you think in terms of dealing with mental health issues, especially like, let's say if we look at what's happening in our community in Cambridge, for mm -hmm. example, I mean, what, have you, what would you say you've observed and what would be your suggestions in terms of how we move forward? Well, there always have been mental health conditions, particularly the very severe psychotic ones, whose origin may be genetic or unreachable by counselling or any kind of behavioural therapy or any kind of medicinal intervention. And that's always been known. There have always been people who are mentally sick and they were in the time of the prophet. And in traditional societies, they are accommodated partly because there's so much work 
that is simple and repetitive in, say, a traditional Moroccan village. Somebody may have an extremely low IQ or have a birth defect, but you can always find something for them to do. Even if it's just working the well or grinding corn, there's always a place for those people in those societies. In our high-tech world where everybody has to use all of the latest apps and software, those people have less to do because we simply don't have the repetitive physical tasks, which themselves maybe have therapeutic value for them. So we tend to section them or we put them in special needs facilities and treat them really as not fully members of society, whereas they should be integrated. Um, and they should still be part of their families, they should still feel part of their neighbourhoods. Uh, I mean, it's a cruel expression, but the village idiot was a figure that was known in traditional England, and he was the guy who would, maybe he could milk cows or do something simple, but was integrated and was a cheerful part of the environment. Uh, and I think that religious communities in particular need to make sure that despite our complex and alienating technological interfaces with life, that we need to have plenty of things that those people can still contribute. So we're not just keeping them busy with toys, but they're actually contributing and they have the satisfaction of knowing that. Value, real yes. value, yeah, yes. which can really benefit a wider society. Yep. Yeah. No, that's really good. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, we've got some more questions that are coming through. I do keep them coming in uh, we, in these last uh, few moments. Um, we've got a question from Ali here, who's asked, um, what, what does Sheikh Abdullah Kim Murad uh, think of the role of urban planning in promoting health? Uh, Muslim societies tend to be very car-centric. Uh, and adverse to pedestrians, uh, should Muslim cities be redesigned? Well, they have been redesigned, that's the problem. A traditional Muslim city is narrow alleyways, uh, neighbourhoods that are independent and locked at night, um, autonomous, really. Uh, yeah. And that le leads to a very strong sense of belonging to a place. It leads to a lot of security because everybody can see who's strange and who belongs. Uh, it gives people the, the nourishment of knowing that there's a place they belong to, that there's a holy place, that there's a mosque, that whatever. And uh, if you visit a traditional Muslim city like Fez in Morocco or Marrakesh or the old city of Lahore, for instance, you see that insistence on the narrow alleyways, the garden that is private, that is within a house that might include 40 or 50 people, an extended family. That's a very beautiful traditional way to live. Nowadays, what you see in even some of the Saudi cities, some of the Algerian cities, is just a Western model that's copied from the United States with big roads full of honking traffic, terrible fumes, and uh, not much of a sense of neighbourhood. So, yeah, that, that's a result of modernisation, uh, the rather inhuman Vegas model that replaces the very beautiful, uh, introspective and humane, small-scale reality of traditional Muslim urban life. Sure. No, thank you very much, uh, Ali, for your question there. We, got, we do have another one uh, from Ismail Mustafa. Uh, what are the key lifestyle changes that we should implement as a community uh, from your observations of our modern lifestyle for both physical and mm -hmm. mental mm -hmm. well-being? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, most of the things are fairly obvious. Uh, we should be eating healthy foods. We should be eating less meat. We should be eating organic wherever we can. We should be trying to cultivate our own vegetables because this is a sunnah and a special benefit in, in that. And we know exactly what additives and uh, phosphates have been used. Uh, particularly if you have small children, it's very important to keep their developing brains away from any possibility of chemical interference because increasingly the scientists are aware of how people are growing up with different brains nowadays because of pollution from soft plastics or fertilizers. Really important that the young people in particular eat natural. Um, yes. We should make sure also that when we consume, say, halal chicken, that the chicken has been ethically sourced. Yeah, it's been reared in the yes. right way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because the prophet says that if one of you mistreats a chicken, he will not be considered one of the righteous. Mm. Yeah. Kindness to animals is important. And if the animal is far away on a farm and you can't see it, that doesn't mean that you're not responsible. So eating organic uh, and eating uh, humanely reared and eating halal should be three aspects of the same thing. And I think this is a, a health revolution that's coming now, but especially some of the older generation are not quite used to these ideas, even though they're obviously good for the health and they're religiously required. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Ismail, for your question. Uh, another one here um, is on 
a healthy living necessitates a healthy food supply. How would you suggest Muslim communities in the United Kingdom uh, develop a more sustainable and mm -hmm. pure diet? Yeah, I mean, uh, some people are financially challenged and find the organic option too expensive. Uh, but increasingly, Muslims have a certain income and where they can choose what is organic without undue additives, without destructive plastic packaging and so forth, that's the option that they should choose. And this is something that is clearly religiously required. And you do find that when people have switched from sort of artificially reared and chemically uh, altered food and they make the switch to something more natural that within a few days they feel much better about themselves. Their sleep patterns are better. It's easier to get up at dawn for the Fajr prayer. They have more strength mm. during the day. Their concentration levels are better. Their memory is improved. It really does make a big difference. So eat less, eat organic, be very careful about the halal, uh, take plenty of exercise. These things can be accomplished uh, quite cheaply. Uh, and also check out the suppliers of uh, responsibly reared uh, food. So there's, I mean, we have a connection with Willowbrook Farm already in Oxfordshire, which is a kind of famous uh, organic halal farm that's been on the BBC and it's kind of yeah. sensational and it's really a successful model. A lot of Muslims go there from over the country if they're really concerned for this aspect of the religion yeah. and they don't trust the supermarket stuff. Uh, but there's other uh, organic halal farms in different parts of the country. There's one in Wales, one in Somerset. And increasingly, I think this is an industry and a sector that people want to get into. Apart from anything else, if you design it correctly, it can be quite lucrative because the market for um, sustainably raised and uh, tayyib halal food is just constantly increasing. Absolutely. I just wanted to also mention about, um, you know, you talked about eating halal, but mm -hmm. also we have to remember that just because... Um, you know, it's not all about eating meat and chicken all the time yep. because it's about having a balanced diet, mm -hmm. it's about moderation. So um, perhaps you can maybe elaborate on that further in terms of it's not always just about just because we can eat meat and chicken or other yes. things like this. It's not no, I mean, that. there are Muslims in Britain who are unhappy if they don't eat meat at least once a day. Mm. Even though they're from countries and places where maybe meat is a treat that you have on Eid or very occasionally and where people probably are living a more healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, so we need to get away from this idea that I have the right to eat red meat every day um, or that I have to have fish every day because that's not what the metabolism requires and uh, it's expensive and also uh, it's against the sunnah because uh, the, the uh, saying of Imam Ali is that man is uh, destroyed by two red things and saved by two black things, al-Ahmaran or al-Aswadan. And the two red things are meat and wine, and the two black things are water and dates. Right. Mm. So it was the way of the early Muslims really not to eat much meat, very occasionally, if it's a treat. You know, but uh, generally, the Holy Prophet would not eat meat day in, day out. And unfortunately, you see some people, even some of the well-nourished Mulvis who keep talking about the sunnah, insisting on eating meat even twice a day sometimes and really kind of packing it away while they're talking about the sunnah, which is kind of ridiculous. And then they end up at the age of 50 having heart disease and diabetes and that's what happens. The sunnah is there to protect you. He doesn't have any other purpose. Yes, it, yeah. of course. I mean, that was, I mean, to us, that's the perfect way of living. You know, we we yep. try to follow the example of the Prophet Muhammad yep. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, we've got another question here for you, Sheikh. Um, what, does, what do you recommend uh, for those that are disabled uh, who cannot venture out mm -hmm. into nature and are tied to their beds? I feel that these people are often not accounted for. That's a question that we have here on YouTube. Uh, what would you respond to that? Well, nowadays you do have, if you really are you know, bedridden and immobile, nature documentaries in glorious HD, and that's sometimes even better than walking around the park because you can see the snow leopards and some of the wonders of the deep. Uh, it can be really quite impressive. When I was a child, it was kind of th the early days of colour TV and you had to struggle a little bit to see the wonders of nature. Now it's more amazing than ever. Yes. Uh, so that is certainly a form of spiritual nourishment. Uh, also sound, I think, that listening to 
uh, the types of traditional sound of inshad, Quranic recitation that are very traditional, seem to reconnect one to something primordial and to the natural world. And I think that also is a very important source of nourishment for the soul. And surrounding oneself, even if it's in one's bedroom, with, with beautiful things and as many natural things as possible, that's going to be nourishing for the soul. Absolutely, because I, I mean, in my experience, of, and since the pandemic started, one of the things that really helped me actually was when I would go to our uh, local science park and there's a nature mm -hmm. reserve in the centre. Yep. And I used to go there quite regularly because I used to find it was so peaceful and actually made me yep. kind of appreciate nature mm -hmm. more than I ever used to. Maybe that's yep. the case for many others as well. Well, the Qur'an is constantly urging us to consider God's signs in the way the heavens and the earth are created. And we're instructed to look at the clouds, to the mountains. It's, it's the book of nature, really. Uh, and nowadays in our urban rushed steel, high-tech environments, we're suffering from what some people call nature deficit disorder. And when we get back into nature, we feel oh, calmer and chilled, uh, particularly if it's virgin nature. You might have seen the article we have on this mosque's website about virgin nature and what the Quran says about it and how healing it is to the human soul. And of course, Muslims have always loved gardens and we have this, mashallah, beautiful Islamic garden here in the Cambridge mosque that everybody just feels calm when they walk through it. It's a good way of getting into the space of the mosque that you go through nature before entering the, the sacred space itself. Yes. Uh, Muslim gardens are famous, the gardens of the Alhambra, the Shalimar gardens, you know, they're some of the greatest gardens in the world. And perhaps we recall Monty Don's recent BBC series, Paradise Gardens, mm. in three parts, which was all about the world's great Islamic gardens. Even Prince Charles has an Islamic garden. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's absolutely fascinating. Um, well, thank you very much for all your questions. Um, we've had some absolutely fantastic um, questions that uh, Sheikh has been able to answer. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, we are coming towards the end of this program, but I just wanted to ask the Sheikh, um, before we wrap up, are there any final words that you would just like to share with our viewers? Uh, just something positive and inspirational for them to take away to you. Oh, I mean, we've been talking about nature and how modernity has made us sick despite medical advances and often inwardly sick because we're separated from nature. And it's important, I think, to remember that uh, the Holy Prophet, in the culminating moment of his career, the Mi'raj, his ascension from Jerusalem up to the presence of God, that extraordinary moment, the angel offers him two cups, two chalices, one full of wine, one full of milk. And the Holy Prophet chooses the glass of milk. And the angel says to him, Hudi talil fitra, you've been guided to nature, which indicates, according to the commentators, that this is going to be the religion which is about affirming nature, about being part of nature, where the form of worship is linked to the rising and the setting of the sun. This is the ummah, the community of nature. And the Holy Prophet, in his very natural lifestyle, is pointing us a way back to overcome modern alienation and the sicknesses that go with us, and to heal us through immersing ourselves in, in the signs of God in the natural world. Thank you very much indeed, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad there. And to all of our viewers as well, uh, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. We really hope that you have enjoyed this program. And uh, just to remind you all, uh, for the latest news and updates uh, from Cambridge Central Mosque, you can visit our website. That is cambridgecentralmosque.org. Uh, you can also find us on social media. So please do find Cambridge Central Mosque on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. Please like, follow and subscribe. And on there, of course, you'll find all the latest news and updates from Europe's first eco-mosque. Um, but that, it, that is it from us here from today. Uh, from myself, Ibrahim Rahman, I've been your host for today. And from Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, the chair of the Board of Trustees at Cambridge Central Mosque, uh, we ask that you please do look after yourselves, keep well and stay safe. It's goodbye from us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.